based on the microstructure and, and the properties, I wanted to delve more into how titanium can be used in the aerospace field. We did our research. We saw that the SR-71 Blackbird is, <laughs> you know, considered the fastest aircraft in the world for 30 years. And it was primarily made of titanium alloys, I believe. And so I wanted to hear your thoughts on why they chose titanium as opposed to any other metal alloy. We get back to another temperature application. So the name of the game in aviation is specific fuel consumption. So how far can you go? What's your bang for your buck when it comes to what a, a gallon of fuel will get you? When you're flying Mach three and a half, I think, maybe it doesn't get you that much anyway, uh, besides, you know, reconnaissance and two armed forces members that come home at the end of the day. I think that's the evasive maneuvers strategy for the SR-71 was just hit the throttle, right? Like, just <laughs> just leave, just, just keep going and, and you've, you've outrun everything else. So that's crucially important. But as you're just massively burning fuel, you also want to be as efficient about that as possible in a certain sense. Now, the speeds that this airplane was going, you know, three times the speed of sound or more are just going to hugely heat up the skin of that aircraft. And I don't think that the skin of that was titanium. I think we're talking structures and things on the inside of the aircraft, but all of that heat needs to go somewhere. And a lot of time it's going to make its way into the, the superstructure of the aircraft, whether it be wing spars or fasteners. Or you, you have to be able to deal with the heat in your structure and not weaken the actual material itself. So titanium is a natural choice for again, that low density material, and then, but also be able to retain the strength that temperatures that speed was causing the skin and therefore the rest of the structure to heat up at. Do you know about the fuel tanks? Yeah, I heard about the fuel tanks thing, yeah. that they waited for thermal expansion to actually keep the fuel inside. Yes, yeah, so if you filled the fuel tanks up and just at room temperature on the runway, they would just leak because the aircraft got so hot, you needed to do something with the the coefficients of thermal expansion and stuff mm -hmm. running into each other. So it was just decided that the fuel tanks were going to leak at room temp so that they would be solid or leak free at the elevated temp that the airplane was actually you know, operating at. But so much so that they put just barely enough fuel in the aircraft for it to take off. And then they would refuel with an airborne tanker. And then they would refill once the plane had heat up a little bit. And, you know, they could actually change the fuel. That airplane's an engineering marvel, and I think anybody from Lockheed would agree with that. There's also tons of room for improvement, I think. That airplane was so fast and so new that they needed to be able to deal with the heat and pick an engineering alloy that was going to be up to the task. And some of the earliest choices for titanium were, you know, capable of, of such things. But if I can divulge a not classified story about the Blackbird 2 and specifically titanium is that, do you know where we got the titanium from to do that? I heard Through shell that. companies and, and lying to the Russians. Wait, really? Yeah. So a lot of the titanium is manufactured comes from this mineral called rutile, which is just mm -hmm. essentially dirty titanium dioxide. To process that, it has to be made into sponge and some other things. But Russia early on is one of the places that was either doing this the best or the earliest. So in order to actually source titanium into the U.S. without it being obvious that it was a military application, the CIA bought a lot of, I guess they incorporated a bunch of shell companies. So they just played like hide the actual owner with uh, a number of countries, the one obviously of interest being Russia. Uh, so we brought in a lot of we, the, the royal we, because I was not alive in the 60s, <laughs> nor, nor working for the CIA, I will point out. Um, but we, we brought in a lot of this material. And frankly, I don't know, and the sources that I can find are mostly unclear and looking at this story because it interests me. A lot of either raw material or titanium through shell companies because they didn't want to know that it was going to be a military application buying in, in huge amounts of the stuff. But when you think like it's, it was some of the, the first titanium brought into this country was probably used in large quantities for that project. You also have to realize there was no real method to weld the stuff yet or machine it or not knowing what coolants you could use. Lockheed learned a ton of stuff about titanium in just the first couple of months or years working on SR-71 and its predecessors. So I think a lot of what we know about how to deal with titanium was developed by Lockheed in that era just because they had to learn because it was the only capable material for that lightweight and high temperature application they were interested in. To speak to one more issue in the aerospace industry that came up with respect to titanium is the, so obviously the SR-71 Blackbird is a, a great example of a success, 
I mean, obviously the plane was kind of eclectic for lack of better words, but obviously it, it did its job quite well. But another application in the aerospace industry where titanium didn't prove to work so well was in the Sioux City incident, which happened um, so many years ago at this point. So speak to the incident that occurred there and how that played into a situation where titanium's properties bit instead of fortuitous for such great applications. So a little bit of context into the Sioux City incident. In 1989, the United Airlines Flight 232 crashed in Sioux City, Iowa killing 184 of the 296 people on board. There was an explosion in the back of the airplane, which was caused by a fan disc failure in the tail engine. This fan disc had a half-inch crack that was entirely missed by human inspection. The creation of the fan disc involved melting titanium, which is a complex process to say the least. If it's exposed to oxygen in high enough quantities, it forms a phase called hard alpha which is very brittle and weak compared to the surrounding alloy material. Due to the formation of this weak hard alpha, a significant crack had formed, eventually leading to the catastrophic failure which caused this incident. So now, on to Dan's response. I'll tell you, like, because of my first job being somebody who essentially would have made that disc that blew apart, that was, I don't know if I want to say my first day, but for sure the first week, I forget it was our quality manager or the head of engineering, whatever, came downstairs and he points us to the URL. I want to say he slapped a book of like the Sioux City report on the table, but he didn't. He was just go read the actual report. It's a hugely lengthy report about how it happened and the the failure analysis that they did based on that. But so clearly at the root of it, right, there was a disc. It was uncontained failure as they'd say in the aviation industry got thrown. What they come to find out is that there's various elemental and microstructural features in there that are detrimental to the behavior of your actual part. So the Sioux City thing was what they'd call a a hard alpha inclusion. And the the finding of the the little booger uh, inside the disc that that got broken and injected was that essentially the melt practice for some of the titanium materials was not yet well understood and well characterized. So if you go to an engine manufacturer or somebody who's using titanium in, in a truly critical application, they'll tell you that you want to use a titanium that's been melted and remelted a number of times. And what that does is that helps to eliminate some of the uh, inclusions that you actually might get in some of your materials. So if you were to go kind of Googling around for providers of quote unquote, there's actually a technical term, premium quality titanium, they would tell you how they actually manufacture it and, you know, all of the history of how much scrap was in it, what the chemistry was. And then you do things like take a slice off of both ends of that ingot, and then you can do something called macro etch it, which is, you know, Metallurgically, you'd etch the plate, but it reveals things that you can see with your eyes rather than like a metallographic microscope. And so they're looking a lot for things like those occlusions where the presence is going to be detrimental to the behavior of your part. And certainly, and perhaps maybe none more famous than the Sioux City incident was, was you know, the finding of, of an inclusion inside of that. Uh, the aviation industry has found their way around by using a manufacturing method for their raw material that involves you know, screening of the input material to a, a very specific level. And then the, the melting procedures are are chosen. Uh, but the aviation industry has thought about what happened and continues to think about what happened every time there's a failure. They address every single portion of that kind of supply chain and, and say, where could this have been caught? Where could this have been better? Um, and specifically with Sioux City, there were a number of findings, but none stands out more to me than the introduction and the you know, nailing down of what premium quality titanium looks like. There are titanium plants out there that are so worried about tungsten inclusions that they'll make you leave your ballpoint pen outside and they will give you a tungsten free ballpoint pen to take inside the facility. The ball of your most big ballpoint pens, for instance, is tungsten carbide. And so if that finds its way into a furnace somehow, and I really don't know how that would happen, but the tungsten inside of your tungsten carbide containing ballpoint pen concerns the aviation industry and titanium industry as well, uh, to the point where they'll give you a tungsten carbide free ballpoint pen when you walk in the door.